The Bible reading is Mark 11, verse 27, which is on page 1016 of the Blue Bibles. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was talking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me. I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and, they, and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask then, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. He said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from some of the, the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. They sent another servant to them. So they struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone builders rejected. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvellous in our eyes. Then the chief priest and the teachers of the law and the elders looked away from, for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Thank you, Sam, very much for reading that passage to us. We're going to be exploring it together, so please keep it open in front of you. I get myself organized up here. And uh, thank you for the, uh, the questions that are written down here. There's some uh, great questions. Um, I, we're not going to be able to answer all of them, although we might get time for one or two at the end. Um, what football team do you support? That's a bit of a painful one for today, isn't it? But hey. Um, why did you leave us? Please, can you make me more like you? What's heaven like? One of the things I love about Christianity is that it is open to question. Some of you may have heard uh, about the debate that happened at the university a couple of weeks ago between Peter Atkins and John Lennox. Peter Atkins is a well-known atheist. John Lennox is a well-known Christian, both professors of science in Oxford. And there was a key moment in the debate where both of them were asked whether it would be conceivable that they would change their minds. I wasn't there, but how it was relayed to me was that Peter Atkins, the atheist, said, no. Even if Jesus was resurrected in front of me, I still wouldn't change my mind. I would just see it as a hoax. Whereas John Lennox said, yeah, if you could disprove the resurrection of Jesus, I would no longer be a Christian. Our faith is open to question. And that's part of its strength. 
And in the passage that we've got in front of us this evening, we find that Jesus is being questioned. Lots and lots of questions. In fact, we've not read all of the questions that uh, are in the passage. We'll see a few more of those in a few minutes. Jesus was himself open to question. But the thing about asking Jesus questions is usually you'll find he ends up asking you a more difficult question than you asked him. He tends to turn tables on you. And that's definitely what's happening in the passage. What was it that kicked the whole thing off? Well, you may remember last week, Jesus goes into the temple, chapter 11, verse 15 to 7, and he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. You remember the disruptive Jesus from last week, but hang on a minute. It is outrageous, isn't it? You just don't do this. It's bad enough to criticize an individual for what they believe. But here is Jesus standing in the premier religious institution of his nation at the time and denouncing the religious practice of a whole nation. That is outrageous. How dare he do that? That's what sets the questions going in this passage. Because that's exactly the question that the religious leaders had. Verse 28, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do this? Jesus, how dare you? How dare you? There are three groups of, three groups of people who are asking the questions. The Pharisees, sometimes called the elders, the Sadducees, and then scribes or teachers of the law. We'll see all of those as we go through the passage. And those together made up something called the Sanhedrin which was a group of 70 men that constituted the kind of main religious and to some extent political authority in Israel at the time. This is where power lay in Jerusalem. And now power is turning against Jesus and asking him what authority he's got to act. First of all, they ask him all together, and then they come one group at a time with question after question after question. But each time they ask him, he answers, and gradually the critics fall silent until at the end of the passage, the question that's left hanging is a question that Jesus himself asks. He turns the tables on us. Because actually, it's Jesus' questions here that prove the most penetrating. So why does Jesus have the authority to act here? There are three reasons, just that we'll see in the passage as a whole. First of all, he's got the authority of the Son. He's the Son of God. He's family with God, and therefore he can speak from God. Then we'll see that he has the authority of a teacher. He's absolutely brilliant in handling the Bible. And finally, we'll see he has the authority of the boss. He is the Lord. We'll see those three things as we go through. First of all, he has the authority of the Son. Sometimes the best answers to questions are actually questions, aren't they? It's often the way. Sometimes people ask me something like, look, why is it actually worth following Jesus? And you can answer lots of ways about that. But actually sometimes the best thing to do is to put the question back and say, well, you want to know why it's worth following Jesus? Can I just ask you, who or what are you following? And why is that worth it? Let's kind of play fair here, shall we? And of course, what always happens is people say, well, no, I'm really not following anybody. I'm just kind of neutral. But ask a few more questions. And often you can help people see that actually none of us lives by ourselves. All of us are influenced by things. All of us have dreams of life that we're pursuing. We're following something. We're following someone. We're not really independent. And as we ask the question, who is it that's shaping your life? What is it that you're following? Is that worth it as well? We can help people see, actually, that following Jesus might just be better. So that's what Jesus does here. He responds to their question with a question. Verse 29, he says, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. Now, John here is John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, 
who before Jesus went public in ministry had gone out into all the countryside in Israel challenging people to get ready because God was coming and they needed to be prepared. And they should be baptized, shoved down in water in order to prepare for his coming. And so Jesus, uh, Jesus' uh, critics say to him, what did you make of John then and his baptism? Was that a God thing or was that just a human thing? And the thing is, the people asking Jesus the question didn't dare to answer because they had too much to lose if they did. Verse 31, they discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he'll say, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, hmm, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. His question silenced them. And so they answered Jesus, verse 33, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Jesus has silenced his critics, but actually, if you think a bit harder, subtly he's been answering their question. Because when Jesus was baptized by John, Mark 1.11 tells us a voice came from heaven that said, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. In other words, John's baptism had identified Jesus as the son of God. So what do the religious leaders make of that? Was that from heaven or wasn't it? Jesus is claiming his family. He is the son. He speaks with the authority of the son of God. That's why he has the right to act. But then he tells a story to make just the same point, but really to ram it home. He says, look, a man planted a vineyard, and he rented it out to tenant farmers who would look after it, look after all the, the vines, and produce a wonderful harvest of grapes. And then harvest comes along, and the guy who owns it, he wants a share of the harvest. So he sends a servant to the vineyard and says to the tenant farmers, look, the owner would like some of these grapes, please. Now's the time. And what do they do? They beat the servant up and send him away empty-handed. So the owner sends another servant, and he says, please, can I have some grapes for the owner? And they beat him up, and they send him away empty-handed. And then he sends another servant, and another servant, and the same thing happens. And so eventually, the owner says, what can I do about this? Who can I send? And he says, well, I'll send my son. Surely, the farmers will listen to him and give me my share of the fruit. But what happens when he sends the son? Verse 7, the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. We'll get the vineyard for ourselves. That was the story. What was the point? Well, in the same way, God had planted Israel as his vineyard. Isaiah, one of the Jewish prophets, spoke about that in Isaiah 5. And he had put tenants in charge, the leaders of the people. And the purpose of the leaders of the people was to help Israel bear fruit. In other words, to help Israel show God's goodness and glory to all the nations so that the nations would see how good God is and come and worship him. That's what the leaders were meant to help the people do, but they didn't. God had sent his prophets, one after another after another, to call for that harvest that he wanted. People living in this way that would show his love and goodness to the nations, but all they got was rejection and abuse and violence. And so now, God's doing like that owner of the vineyard did. He's sending his son. Surely they'll respect my son, he says. But the tenants, the leaders of the people, they are about to kill the son and claim the power for themselves. But that's not going to be the end of the story. Verse 9, what would the owner of the vineyard do? He'll come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. In other words, though the leaders are about to kill Jesus, the son, God will dismiss them, hand the vineyard over to other people, and raise Jesus from the dead. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus did rise from the dead, and in AD 70, the temple was destroyed. The vineyard handed over to new owners. 
Jesus speaks with the authority of the Son. And that's why he does have the right to question our religion. What about us? We say we don't want anyone to tell us what we believe. And that's fair enough if we're just talking about another messed up human being like ourselves. They don't have the right to question what we believe, perhaps. But what if Jesus actually is the Son of God, as he claims? Because he clearly is making that claim here. What if he is? What do you make of that claim? Was he crazy to say he was the Son of God? Was he wicked to say he was the son of God? Or was he actually speaking the truth? Those are your options. Which way does the evidence point? You have to make your choice, but it's hard on the basis of the evidence to say that we think he was crazy or that we think he was wicked. So what if he was right? What if he really was the son speaking with the authority of God himself? Then he does have the right to ask me and you Really tough questions, doesn't he? If he's the son of God, he has the right to question what we believe and why we believe it and what we do in response to what we believe. And we must listen because he speaks with the authority of the son. Second, he speaks with the authority of an expert, the authority of a teacher. I like all the keep calm signs that are around, don't you? Keep calm and trust the experts. Do you trust the experts? We don't always trust the experts, do we? But often it's a good idea to trust the experts. Uh, The other day, um, we we have some people staying in our little house out in the forest. And um, a little while ago, they texted me um, with a whole list of disasters of things that have gone wrong with our little house there. The main thing was that the loo is linking and you need to get a plumber. Well, fancying myself as a bit of a hero, I went and pulled the loo all apart and uh, put it all back together, and it wasn't leaking. Give or take a little bit. I mean, it was leaking, but just not quite as much as it was before. And then when I flushed it, it was leaking a bit more. And I kind of wiggled it around, and the whole thing was about to fall apart again, and I thought... I'm really not an expert, am I? So I finally gave in and got a great plumber who came along and said, sorry, your loo cannot be repaired. And half the floor is rotten to pieces. You're going to have to strip out everything and start all over again. Well, I have to say, I trust the expert opinion more than I trust my own when it comes to plumbing in the bathroom, even though I don't like the price tag that goes with it. Trust the expert. What about Jesus? Is he an expert whose opinion we should follow? Is he a credible teacher of God's words? Well, that's the next line of attack from Jesus' critics. They say, no, he isn't a proper teacher. First of all, they ask him this question about whether they should pay their taxes, their money, to the Roman government, verses 13 to 17. But it's tricky. Verse 13 They sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. You're not swayed by others, blah, blah, blah. Is it right to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Now, the tricky thing is, there's two groups here, the Pharisees and the people from Herod, the Herodians, and they didn't agree on this. The Pharisees hated the Romans with a passion and never wanted to give them a penny. The Sadducees, uh, sorry, the Herodians got on rather well with the Romans and thought you should pay the tax. So Jesus is being caught in a trap. What makes it even worse is that your average Jewish bloke on the street also hated the Romans. So if Jesus says you should pay the taxes, then all the crowd will turn against him. And if Jesus says you shouldn't pay the taxes, then the government will come down on him. Do you see the trap that he's in? It's a really tricky one. What is Jesus going to say? Verse 16, Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius, that's a coin, and let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Here is a picture of a denarius, a coin. And uh, it's got this uh, inscription around it, Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus, roughly that. I mean, it was in Latin, but... That's close enough. And then there's the picture of Caesar on the coin. And so Jesus points to that image of the Caesar. 
And he says, verse 17, Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what is God's. It's a genius answer, isn't it? I mean, the Pharisees may not like the answer, but honestly, how can you argue with it? There is Caesar's picture on it, so give him the coin. But that's not all Jesus says. He seizes the initiative. Effectively, he's asking us a question as he says, and give to God what is God's. What's he talking about? Well, you give the coin to Caesar because it's got his image stamped on it. So what is, that, what is it that has the image of God stamped on it? Hmm. It's human beings, isn't it? It's us. It's you. It's me. Pay your taxes to Caesar, yes, but give yourself to God. Let God be in charge of your life. That's what Jesus is saying. It's actually a massive challenge. Is God in charge? Or are we still clinging to power for ourselves? Jesus has turned tables. He's an expert teacher. But then there's the second thing that comes up. Will the dead really be raised? And I know that isn't something that we talk about very much in our canteens at work or college or whatever. But at the time, this was a really big issue. Because the Pharisees, it's them again, they believed that at the end of time, the dead would be raised and there'd be kind of a new age where people were resurrected. But the Sadducees, they didn't believe that there would be a resurrection. And they, they justified that because they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. And they said, in the first five books of the Bible, you won't find the resurrection being taught. So no, the dead won't rise. But actually, there's a little bit more to it than that because the Sadducees, they were quite close to the Romans. And they were doing very nicely, thank you, in the present age. So frankly, they had no interest in a resurrection age to come. We don't want any of that nonsense. We're quite happy now. That was the Sadducees. And so Jesus gives them, uh, so they, they give Jesus this kind of riddle. They say, look, in the scriptures, back in those first five books of the Bible, if a married man dies without leaving any kids, the man's brother, if he has one, should marry the widow and have kids for him. You can read about it in the Old Testament. It's called the Leverate Marriage. Now, let's have a bit of fun with this, the Sadducees say. Let's imagine that there are seven brothers. The first one marries, has no kids, and dies. So, the second one marries the widow, but also has no kids, and he dies. And then the third, and then the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. Poor, poor woman, honestly. And after seven, she dies too. There's no wonder, isn't it? I think my wife would say one husband is more than enough trouble. Who wants seven? <laughs> but then the Sadducees say, if the dead do rise, whose wife will she be? Because she's had seven husbands. How does Jesus respond? Verse 24, are you not in error, you Sadducees, because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? That absolutely cuts into the Sadducees. See, they were into two things. They were into their Bible, their first five books of the Bible, and Jesus is saying, you don't actually even understand them. And also, they were into their power because they were pretty snuggled up to the Romans. But Jesus is saying, you don't know the power of God. You don't know either the scriptures or the power. The very things you prize, you actually haven't got a clue about. So, if death is no more because the dead are raised, you don't need to make babies. So you don't need a man and woman bound together in covenant relationship to bring them up. In the resurrection, relationships will change. Verse 25, when the dead rise, they won't either marry or be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. 
But you Sadducees, in any case, you're not reading your own scriptures properly. Verse 26, about the dead rising. Haven't you read in the book of Moses, that was their Bible, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to them, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. In other words, he's saying, look, God made these amazing promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, but those promises weren't fulfilled until long after they had died. And therefore, those promises would be meaningless as promises to them if they're not brought back to life to share in their fulfillment. Jesus says, you don't understand even your own scriptures. You Sadducees, for all your religious conservatism, loving your Bibles, you're so locked into getting what you want out of this life that you've closed your mind to eternity. And Jesus says that's a very bad mistake. It's pretty challenging for us as well, isn't it? We can be very smug and religious, very conservative, and yet actually pursue such comfortable, self-pleasing lives now that we really have no thought of eternity, of answering to God when Jesus comes back and asks us what we've done with the life that he gave us. Bad mistake, Jesus says. He's quite a teacher, isn't he? He's a real expert. And then there's a third example here. What is the greatest commandment? The final group in the Sanhedrin were the scribes, also known as the teachers of the law. Now it's their turn, but you get the sense when it gets to this third one that Jesus' expertise as a teacher is now so kind of unassailable that this lone individual comes in a slightly different spirit to the previous ones. The feel is different. Verse 28, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing Jesus had given them a good answer, he said, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The rabbis said there were 613 commandments. That's a whole bunch of laws, isn't it? 613 commandments. But Jesus is prepared to boil them down to essentially Just two. Verse 29. The most important one, Jesus said, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, look, this is really, really important because... This is not the way that we think in our society today. If you were going to go out onto the high street of Southampton and do a kind of survey, what do people think is the biggest moral responsibility that we have as human beings? What people would basically say is, well, it's all to do with how you treat other people. That's the big moral question, isn't it? What about relationship with God? Well, that's a lifestyle preference, just a choice that you meet, not really a moral issue. Jesus says... You're turning reality upside down when you think that way. Think about it for a moment. Why is it important that we care about other people? Really, why is it? I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, maybe we shouldn't. Let the fittest survive so the species can advance. Why be so sentimental about people, especially broken people? What's the reason? And honestly, you're hard pushed to get an answer to that question if you don't put God in the picture. But when you do, the answer is obvious. We care for people because they are made in the image of God. That's why. Every single one of them. And therefore, they're significant and valuable. Every one of them. However broken, however troubled, however messed up, they matter. Because God matters. And they're made in his image. That's why we love doing things in this church that minister to the obviously broken people in our city, feeding the hungry down in Basics Bank, welcoming people with many challenging life situations in our big breakfast on Thursday, helping those who are indebted through CAP, welcoming internationals to learn how to participate in our society in the language cafe, and so on and so on. Why do we do it? Because every human being matters because they're made in the image of God and therefore should be loved. But if God is in the picture, then he is supremely important. And therefore loving him must 
come first. We're created by him and for him. And so to love him with all that we are, that's the most important responsibility that we have. That's what we were made for. That's what Jesus says. And the teacher of the law agrees. Jesus really is an expert teacher. But hang on, don't just conclude he's an expert teacher. Just have a little think about your life and mine at that point. Loving God with everything we are. Loving other people as if they were us. How do you measure up against that, honestly? I have to tell you, I don't measure up against that. I fall an awful long way short of it. And yet this is the bottom line. This is the basics of living the kind of life that God is looking for. And we fall such a long way short, which is why we need help. We need a rescuer. We need what the Hebrews called a Messiah, someone who would come and sort out the mess. And that is who Jesus is claiming to be as he finally turns tables and asks us the question. Verse 35, while Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers say that the Messiah is the son of David? The Messiah, the rescuer. Why do they say he's gonna come from David's line and be his son? But Jesus is saying, look, all your ideas of this rescuer are too small. You're just thinking of another David, just another great king. But David himself said he'd be far greater than that. Verse 36, David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him, the Messiah, Lord, so how can he be his son? As well. Do you see what he's saying? Look, King David looked forward to this rescuer that God was going to send to sort out the mess, and he called him his Lord. So the Messiah must be much, much greater than you ever thought he was. He is the Lord. In other words, here's the final thing he's the boss. He speaks with the authority of the Lord. We saw last week what Jesus said he had come to do as the Messiah. He'd come to rescue us. How had he done that? I thought it was coming up on the screen, but it's not. Never mind. He'd come to do it, Mark 10, verse 45, by giving up his life as a ransom for many. In other words, dying for us so that we could be forgiven and set free. That's how the Messiah rescues us. And that's what we need because we don't love God with all that we are. And we don't love other people unselfishly as if they were ourselves. We just don't, do we? We need forgiveness. We need a Messiah who died for us to clear up the mess and give us a fresh start. And that's the Messiah that Jesus is. But maybe you feel outraged by Jesus' analysis of your failure. You want to say, I'm a good person. I don't need forgiveness. Maybe you feel insulted by the idea that you need a rescuer who would die for you. But listen, remember who's speaking. Jesus is the Messiah and the Lord. He's the boss, the master. He's the greatest of all kings. And if you're wise, you listen to the boss because the boss has the final say. Jesus has the final say. He was way greater than King David. He is the ultimate Lord, the ultimate boss. He isn't just the son of David. He's the son of God. So you need to listen. What awesome authority Jesus has, doesn't he? The authority of family, of experts and boss. The authority of the son of God, the authority of God's teacher, the authority of the Lord himself. What's the response that he's looking for from you and me? Not that we become all religious. Religion so often turns in on itself and becomes self-serving rather than self-giving. That's what verses 38 to 40 say. Now, what he wants is for us ordinary people to give ourselves to him, to make him Lord of everything we are and everything we have, whether that's much or little. And so 
the passage finishes with the story of a lovely little old lady who had almost nothing. Verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd put their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. Hmm, impressive. But a poor widow came in and put two very small copper coins worth only a few pence. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Got it? She put in everything, all she had to live on. That's what Jesus is looking for. Ordinary people, not self-important people, Ordinary people who will give him everything. Ordinary people who will make him Lord, in charge of the whole of their lives, whether they have much or have little. So rather than being offended by Jesus' words, I want us this evening just to stop and feel the weight of his authority. He's the Son of God. He's the expert teacher. He's the boss, the Lord. He has the right to challenge us because he is the son of God. He has the right to expose our lack of understanding because the ex he's the expert teacher. And he's the right to expect our total allegiance because he is the Lord. And he has the love to restore our mess ups because he's the Messiah who died for us. Friend, is he... Lord of your life. I don't just mean did you tick a box one day and said, yeah, I prayed a prayer. No, no. Is he in charge of your life? Actually in charge, day to day, making a difference on how you use your time, how you spend your money, what you're looking for. Is he Lord of my life? Lord of your life, really? Or are you still calling the shots? He wants us to put everything into the offering pot, not just a few quid, everything, all that we have to live on. He wants us to give it to him, to trust him, and to say, Jesus, you have the authority. You are in charge. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so sorry that so often we want to be in charge. We want the power but please help us this evening to feel your authority and to know that it is in loving you and making you Lord of everything that we find our real joy, our true satisfaction, the whole direction and meaning of our lives. We want you to be Lord. Please take charge, we pray. Amen.